Okay, so next speaker is John McCreevy from UCSD. He'll tell us about mean string field theory, Landau Ginzburg theory from one form of symmetries. Please start. Okay, thanks, Toshi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So this is a talk about uh, work with Nabil Iqbal, some of which we just posted. And it's uh, part of a larger program whose goal is to enlarge the Landau paradigm. So by the Landau paradigm, what I mean is the idea, the sort of principle, that phases of matter should be classified by how they represent their symmetries, in particular by what symmetries they spontaneously break. And furthermore, that at critical points, the critical degrees of freedom should be the fluctuations of the order parameter that breaks those symmetries. And I guess there's a sort of corollary of this that gapless excitations or degeneracy that's stable, that, that exists in a phase, should arise as Goldstone modes for spontaneously broken symmetries. And uh, there's, a, there's a sort of weaponization of this point of view, which is Landau Ginzburg theory, which is, a, which is useful for finding representative states, for studying excitations above those ground states, for understanding the gross phase diagram of such theories, and it even quantitatively describes phase transitions in high enough dimensions. Okay, so there are some apparent exceptions to this grand viewpoint on the world, among which I'll mention two. The first is topological order, by which I mean some stable ground state degeneracy that depends on the topology of space. Uh, examples include the deconfined phase of discrete gauge theory and fractional quantum Hall states. And another class of examples is just any other deconfined states of gauge theory, such as the Coulomb phase of electricity and magnetism by which we are seeing each other. And so, um, in fact, both of these apparent counterexamples can be incorporated into a suitably enlarged land of paradigm by generalizing our notion of symmetry. Um, and uh, the goal, our goal of this talk will be to understand how, how to correspondingly generalize uh, Lando Ginsburg theory, at least in, in the simplest case. Uh, so the generalization of symmetry I have in mind is higher form symmetries. It's sort of the, actually the, maybe the simplest possible generalization. And actually, we're, I'm only going to talk about one form symmetries in this talk. So let me remind you what this is. A zero form symmetry, if it's continuous, is associated with a conserved current. You can integrate that over a co-dimension one slice of space time, which we usually think of as a time slice and to get a, a conserved charge. And the statement that that, thing, that charge is conserved is usually regarded as saying that charged particle world lines piercing that, that it counts the number of charged particle world lines piercing that constant time slice and they can't end. They can only end on charged operators, which are point-like and create and annihilate these particles. And the operator that creates and annihilates these particles is charged under that, under that symmetry. It transforms like this, where alpha is a, a closed zero form. A one-form symmetry is just the same, except the current is a two-form. A two-form is something that you can integrate over a co-dimension two slice of space-time to get a number. And if it's conserved, then that number doesn't depend on deformations of that surface. And a good way to think about that is here's a, this black thing is a co-dimension two thing, and it counts the number of string world sheets that it pierces. And so the, the statement of conservation says that these string world sheets can't end, except on charged operators. And now a charged operator is a thing that creates a string. and uh, transforms like this under the, under the global one form symmetry where gamma is a closed one form. Okay, so some, some physics contexts where such a symmetry arises are ordinary e &M, where the, if in the absence of magnetic monopoles, the magnetic flux lines can't end, the charged line operator is the Otuff line. Many gauge theories with, without fundamental matter enjoy a one form center symmetry, discrete center symmetry, under which the charged line operator is the Wilson line. And the ordinary 3D Ising model has a one form symmetry Z2 one form symmetry, which reflects the integrity of the domain walls between the regions of upspins and downspins. And the line operator is the disorder operator. Okay, so anything we can do with, zero, with ordinary symmetries, we can do with generalized symmetries. In particular, they can be spontaneously broken. What it means for a one form symmetry to be spontaneously broken is the following. Well, so, okay, so it's not spontaneously broken if correlation functions of charged operators are short ranged, meaning that they decay when the, ob when the charged object grows. The charged object here is a loop. It, it, we should, the right way to think about its size is the area of the minimal surface bounded by C. So it's un, the symmetry is unbroken if there is an area law for the charge loop operator. And in contrast, it's broken if there's a perimeter law. And um, the perimeter law we should really think of as a constant as we saw in the previous talk, because usually we can, we can get rid of this perimeter law by local, count, local counter terms along the operator. And so this just means that there's some large loop operator that has an expectation value. And so this has been a, a very fruitful idea. In particular, it can be used to, to understand topological order as some, uh, indeed as spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this is actually, it's actually a pretty tautological statement because topological order means that there are, there are ground states 
which are distinguished from each other, which to get from one to the other, we act not by any local operator, but rather by some, some non-local operator, which is exactly the representation on the Hilbert space of, the, of some higher form symmetry with some suitable tuft anomaly. Okay, and in, in the case of a U1, one form symmetry, uh, if it's spontaneously broken, it produces a Goldstone boson, which uh, uh, indeed the, we can think of the photon as, as being, the masslessness of the photon as being protected by such a, such a concept. So we'll, this statement we'll see very explicitly in just a minute, and it's been, it's been useful for, for a number of other things, which I won't say anything about. So before, before concluding this brief introduction, I need, to, um, I need to say something about the robustness of higher form symmetry. So you might think that it's kind of a weird idea to, to imagine that microscopically there are closed strings that can't end. It's like, it's like a string theory without D brains. Um, and, uh, and so to, to make us feel better about that, I need to point out a very important difference between one form symmetries and indeed any higher form symmetry and zero form symmetries, which is that we're used to the idea that the consequences of emergent symmetries, like, which are in high, the high energy literature are called accidental, uh, that the consequences are only approximate. You know, for example, if you, ex if you explicitly break a continuous zero form symmetry that's spontaneously broken, it gives, a, it gives a corresponding mass to the Goldstone boson. And so you can ask, so you know, a question that, that I'm sure uh, anyone would have when encountering this for the first time is, uh, so does this mean that it, so it, I just said that the photon is a Goldstone boson for the symmetry that enforces the, the fact that magnetic flux lines don't end. So in the presence of even very heavy magnetic monopoles, there's the, this symmetry is explicitly broken. And so does that mean that, that there's a mass for the photon? in the presence of even arbitrarily heavy monopoles? And the answer to this question is no, which, which I think is, is a pretty striking fact. And it can be understood from various points of view, which I won't explain right now. So, so the point of this slide is that higher form symmetries are actually, when they're present, even approximately, they, they, they exist, there's actually a phase where, they, where they're present. Okay, so the, the goal of this talk can be explained very simply and uh, in terms of the method of the missing box. So as I mentioned, lander ginsburg theory is sort of our zeroth order tool for understanding symmetry breaking phases and their neighbors in the phase diagram. And so let's ask, so zero form symmetry is to this Lando Ginsburg mean field theory as one form symmetry is to what? So our goal is to fill in this missing box. And to do that, let me give a brief reminder, a sort of Wilsonian reminder on what, what I mean by Lando Ginsburg theory. And so here, um, the, the key idea is to introduce a field that transforms linearly under, under the symmetry. Let's think about the case of a U1 zero form symmetry and so we'll introduce this order parameter field and we should regard it as a coarse grained object. This is, a, this is an effective long, long wavelength description valid below some scale. And uh, the, the principle, the idea that we can understand the phase just in terms of the, the symmetry degrees of freedom says that the effective action for this field should be, should be local. That is, there's no, no other gapless modes that we have to integrate out. Um, and, and we should just add all local symmetric terms, symmetric into this zero form symmetry, organized in a derivative expansion where the higher order terms are suppressed by powers of this, this short distance that we, beyond which this, the theory breaks down. So from this logic, we arrive at this, the familiar, familiar action. And one way to make contact with a particular microscopic Hamiltonian is, is by the variational principle. So the idea is to make an ansatz for the ground state in the form of a product over points in space where each the state at each point in space is uh, determined by the value of the field there. And taking the expectation value of, of whatever Hamiltonian you like, microscopic Hamiltonian, in, in such a state produces a, a functional, which is of the form of the Hamiltonian that you would get from this action with, with specific coefficients. So that's a good, a good way to think about where these coefficients are determined if you want to actually determine them. Okay, so let's em embrace our naivete and work purely by analogy. And let's think about what ingredients we need to construct an analog of that for one form symmetries. So the field in the zero form case was a function from the space of points to a linear representation of G, which transforms in this way, where as I said, alpha is a closed zero form. The analog of that is now, so instead of the space of points, we have to think about the space of loops and the field is a functional from the space of loops to some linear representation of G. It transforms like this, where now gamma is a closed one form. To write kinetic terms, we need, to, we need a derivative. That in the ordinary case, it, com it compares the value of the field at nearby points in space-time. And the analog of that is this area derivative introduced by Migdal and Polyakov, which compares the field at nearby loops. And then nearby loops differ by some, some little chunk of loop uh, in some particular plane attached at some point on, on the given loop. 
Um, in order to write an action, we need to integrate, in the ordinary case, integrate over the space of points. The analog of that is integrating over the space of loops, um, which uh, this, is, this is just the path, like the path integral for a, for a charged particle. And uh, it would be fine tuning not to include some exponential dependence on the mass here. Um, okay, and then finally, uh, given a global symmetry, a useful maneuver is to couple it to, a background, to background fields um, in, a, in a gauge invariant way. So I should emphasize here, I'm not gauging the symmetry, I'm just coupling to background fields. Um, and uh, to do that, we need to promote the ordinary derivative to a, a covariant derivative that tra transforms linearly just like the field. And so the analog of that for one form symmetry is the background field is a two form. And there's a very nice, very natural generalization of the area derivative, which is a combination of the area derivative and a coupling to this two form, which I believe was first written down by Sujong. Um, okay, so with these ingredients, we can, we can follow the, the principle and just write down all terms consistent with, with uh, basic principles in, a, in an expansion in, in powers of these area derivatives. And so we can write terms that are completely local in loop space. So this, this part of the action is essentially a field, the ordinary field theory in loop space. Um, there's, there can be terms involving some potential with various powers of the string field. And we can write a, a, a connect term like this. And, uh, but uh, a surprise perhaps is that there's a, 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 another large class of terms which, are also, which also preserve the one form symmetry, but which are not local in loop, loop space. They rather, for any collection of loops, the, the sum of which um, adds up to the, to the original loop uh, in the sense of integration domains, a term like this where the strings recombine also respects the one form symmetry. And so this action is, is natural under the following assumptions, it, it, it's invariant under the one form symmetry. It's local in ordinary space time. So I said this term is not local in loop space, but it is local in ordinary space because the center of this, there's only a single integral over the center of mass of these loops. The center of mass position of loop one determines that of loop two and three. Uh, I demand invariance under ordinary rotation and translation invariance just to make it look nice. And then finally, I demand a certain translation invariance in loop space so that the dependence on the loop in the action is only is essentially only through the field. So there's the, these coefficients can't have some arbitrary dependence on the loop, um, and that follows from from a certain translation invariance in loop space. Okay, so uh, I should make some disclaimers at this point. I, I've said the word string field various times. I should emphasize that the theory I'm talking about is not at all UV complete. There's no no gravity involved, and I, we expect no connection to the real string field theory. We're trying to do something much less difficult. These are effective strings. Um, I should say that a gauged version of this model where the one form symmetry was, was gauged, where there wasn't actually a one form symmetry uh, and without this recombination term was studied long ago by Sujong as a description of a Higgs mechanism for two forms. And then a bit later as an attempt to, to give a dual description of superfluids and three plus one dimensions. Um, so the, the question that we'd like to answer then is, is what does this model describe? And uh, a, I think a, pl a plausible goal is to use it to develop a, a picture of the phase diagram for, for any system that has such a one form symmetry or at least for a large simple class of such systems. Okay, so, so beginning classically, we can write the equations of motion. Um, this is a, think of this as a picture of an equation. The way you should think of this equation is as a recursion relation, given the value of the string field on, a, on some loop, it determines the value of the string field on a slightly larger loop like this. And clearly that such a recursion relation requires an initial condition uh, starting from small loops. And the initial condition says that small loops can shrink to nothing. There's some non-zero amplitude for that to happen. And that's consistent with the symmetries because a small contractible loop is neutral under the one form symmetry. And this, <clears throat> this will nicely match to gauge theory in the broken phase as we'll see. So, okay, so let's begin with uh, uh, in the regime where the potential looks like this, where the coefficient of the quadratic term is positive. So it makes the field want to be small. Um, the field being zero is not consistent with the boundary condition. And so to do better, let's make an ansatz that the, the dependence on the field, the dependence of the field on the loop is only through the area of the minimal area surface bounded by that loop. And this turns out to be a very good ansatz because the equations of motion at large area have a self-consistent solution of this form. Corrections are suppressed by pow inverse powers of the area. And so this is an area law. This, is, so this indeed does describe the, broken the unbroken phase. Um, where there's an area law for the order parameter with the string tension that goes like the square root of this parameter. So let's ask what happens when we make that parameter negative. That produces a phase where the strings want to condense. 
and we can ask about fluctuations about that about such a ground state. The fluctuations which change the magnitude of the field are clearly gapped because that requires going up this hill. But the fluctuations that only change the phase involve motions in the bottom of this well. It's, it's less obvious. So let's make a general ansatz um, for variations of the phase. This term is special because it's geometric. It depends only on the loop and not on any other data. And if we plug this back into the action using standard world line, by now standard world line techniques like in Matt Strassler's thesis, the action that we find is Maxwell theory for this geometric mode. So, so F here is the field strength of DA, this A, and uh, all of the other modes are massive. And so looking at the form of this term, it's exactly of, of the form of a slowly varying space-time dependent one form symmetry transformation. It's exactly a Goldstone boson for the one, one form symmetry, um, voila. Okay, so, so uh, another nice thing to notice is that the gauge coupling, the coefficient of this term is, is determined by the stiffness meaning the, the magnitude of the order parameter breaking the one-form symmetry. And all the other modes are massive. Um, okay, so now, so we've made contact with some familiar things. Uh, now we can ask, what is, this, what is this theory good for? And one, one important purpose for ordinary lambda gisberg theory is in service of a, a topological theory of the, of the topological defects in the broken phase. So for example, if you spontaneously broke a zero-form symmetry, there's a, a co-dimension two defect in space-time in the core of which the order parameter vanishes and around which its phase winds, a vortex. Um, so let's ask about analogs of that in this case. So one way to think about that is to choose a, some subspace of space time. Think about, for example, think about a, a Q minus one sphere surrounding a co-dimension Q locus in flat space X and imagine that on that locus, the order parameter is non-zero. That defines a map from the loop space of X to U1. This, the target is the phase of the order parameter and the loop space, by loop space of S, I just mean the space of maps from the circle into X. And so defects linked with X are, are then labeled by homotopy classes of such maps. And in the special case where X is simply connected, such as for a sphere, then this, these homotopy classes of such maps are just pi two of X. And so from this, we can conclude that in the case of a U1 one form symmetry, the, the, the analog of the topological theory of defects says that there's only one kind of defect, which is a co-dimension three, which is exactly the magnetic monocle. And there's only one kind of texture, which is the non-zero uh, flux. Okay, so in, the, in that list of physical examples of one-form symmetries that it gave, most, most of them were discrete. To study discrete one-form symmetries with this theory, we can simply explicitly break the UN one-form symmetry down to a ZP subgroup by adding a term like this, which is some pth power of the order parameter field. And in the broken phase, this action takes a form like this, which minimizing which requires that the gauge field is flat and that its holonomy is a, is a pth root of unity. Um, a, a, a useful way to think about this term here is it's the path integral for a charged particle coupled to this gauge field A. And a charged particle, a collection of charged particles can have a phase, which is a superfluid. And uh, uh, this Lagrange multiplier B that imposes the flatness of this gauge field is just the dual D minus two form dual to the to that superfluid order parameter, and so this produces exactly an effective description of ZP gauge theory, as we might expect based on the idea that um, topological order is global, is spontaneous breaking of one form symmetries. Okay, so now something you might be nervous about, and certainly I was for a long time, uh, is that I've written this theory where the action is a path integral with all these crazy derivatives. Is it really well defined? Um, and so one way that we've made ourselves feel better about that is defining it on the lattice. And so one way to do that is to think about, is to find the analog of this variational perspective. So let's think about a simple example of a system with a one form symmetry, namely ZP gauge theory, the perturbed Torah code. And let's think about the case where P equals two for simplicity so that we can make the Hilbert space by putting a qubit on each link of some cell complex. And let's, let's say if, this, if that qubit has spin down, we'll say that the, the link, the corresponding link is covered with a segment of string. In, in that language, the Hamiltonian has three terms. It's very simple. The first term imposes that those strings are closed. And we really impose that really strongly because we want there to be a one form symmetry. Uh, the second term allows the strings to hop around a plaquette. And the third term says that those strings can have a tension. In the limit when the tension is zero, all the terms commute and the ground state is uh, a uniform superposition of, of closed loops. And if we turn on this, this, this tension, eventually if we make it big enough, there's a transition from this topological ordered phase to, to a confined phase. So now what's the analog of this product state ansatz for one form symmetries? It seems to be 
a state where the wave function of a single connected loop, psi of little c, determines the wave function of, a, of the arbitrary collection of loops. So something, something like this. And indeed, if we evaluate the expectation value of the Tory code Hamiltonian or anything related to it in such a state, we find a functional that's, that's uh, a lattice version of the, this mean string theory. Uh, five, five minutes for your talk. Great, thanks. Uh, a lattice version of this mean string field theory uh, Hamilton. So in the remaining five minutes, let me make some comments about phase transitions, uh, slightly more speculative. Um, so if we were to ignore this recombination term, for example, if there were some additional psi goes to minus psi symmetry that forbade it for some reason, then we predict a continuous mean field transition at uh, r equals zero, um, where the, the, the tension goes like r minus rc to the x, this defines a critical exponent, and our value of the critical exponent is, exact, is the most mean fieldy, mean fieldy of critical exponents, which is quite different from the value seen in numerical simulations, for example, in three dimensions with Z2 symmetry. Um, a way to make ourselves feel better about that is that dimensional analysis says that the upper critical dimension, where the side of the fourth term becomes marginal, is, is eight space-time dimensions. So this is quite far below the upper critical dimension. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that this value of eight for the upper critical dimension of the theory of one form symmetries was predicted by Parisi based on the analog of Semanzik's argument in the ordinary case, um, estimating the fractal dimension of random surfaces. Um, okay, but, but the, why should we ignore this recombination term? And I think the most surprising and interesting outcome of our analysis so far is that there is a term which respects the symmetries for a theory of one form symmetries, there's a term with respect to symmet respects to the symmetries, which is cubic in the order parameter. And this strongly suggests that the generic transition should be first order. Um, and uh, this, if true, provides an appealing explanation for a whole lot of uh, observations in, in numerical simulations looking for continuous transitions, uh, continuous deconfinement transitions in gauge theory in higher dimensions. Um, okay, so however, <coughs> four dimensions is special. Uh, four dimensions is special because that's the in, in that dimension, the the string field is dimensionless. So in the same way that in, in two dimensions, the order parameter field for a zero form symmetry is dimensionless, and this leads to costless thalus physics. In in four dimensions, the the this string field is dimensionless, and so this leads to a possibility of a costless thalus like transition, where the dimension of the field of the operator breaking this, the u one symmetry down to zp, uh, its dimension depends on the coupling, which in turn is determined by uh, our tuning parameter. And its dimension can, can uh, pass through four. It can go from irrelevant to relevant uh, at some critical value of the coupling. Uh, if this operator is irrelevant, it means that even though microscopically the potential is corrugated, the low energy physics doesn't see the corrugation. And so there'll be some, some phase with a, with a photon anyway. And indeed such a phase is seen in three plus one dimensional ZP lattice gauge theory for large enough P. The phase diagram looks something like this. this. This is P, this is our tuning parameter, which determines the gauge coupling. And for large enough P, there's an intermediate phase with a photon separated by costless thalus transitions from the topological order phase and the, decon and the confined phase. So final comments. There's a lot more to understand about, about this theory. It's not quite under control, but likely can be put under control. And the main thing that we don't understand is the theory of renormalization. So I just said something about dimensions of loop operators, but we need to understand that a bit better. And one reason that we might, we'd like to is perhaps we can find new, new RG fixed points in this way, which we wouldn't find using ordinary field theory. I didn't actually add quite the most general terms to this Hamiltonian because I didn't write any topological terms or WW terms. Um, by thinking about such terms, we can, we can describe one form symmetry protected topological phases and we can realize more general gauge theories as the broken phase. And then an important motivation besides the ones I've said for this line of thought, I think, is, is to try to develop a better understanding of what is the gauge theory. I think it's clear that a definition in terms of some redundancy is inadequate. Um, and, and here, we so by starting with a, with a theory that, that has the right symmetries, we've recovered some universal properties of gauge theory, sort of going in the opposite direction from what, what uh, Polyakov and Migdal and Mikiki, Mikiko and these guys were trying to do in the 80s. And so finally, um, the question remains whether this a suitably enlarged Landau paradigm, including all possible generalizations of the notion of symmetry and their anomalies, um, can, can indeed be used to understand all, all phases of matter uh, as, a, as a consequence of symmetry.
Okay, so that, that's the end. Thanks to the organizers for this great meeting and thanks, thanks to you for listening. Thank you very much for very beautiful talk. It's time for questions. Uh, she... uh, uh, hi, John. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of questions. So for, uh, first, um, uh, how does the uh, direct expansion of the effective stream that Ofer was talking about this morning uh, relate to uh, uh, your uh, expansion of the stream field? Actually, can, can, are, are they in one-to-one -one correspondence? That, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer yet. Yeah, um, so we've, I, I should emphasize, we've really only done very primitive things of, of, of deriving sort of the, the leading terms in, in the effective action in, in, the, in the various phases. And I think uh, uh, indeed it, it's, it, it, there should be such a correspondence, right? It's a, just a different set of variables for writing the same thing. Uh, uh, I have another uh, small question about this uh, bro broken phase where you uh, wrote the, uh, the, the string field is a uh, constant. Do you, do you actually mean it is a constant on the entire loop phase? You mean the un, the unbroken phase? Here. The the the, the broken phase. Here, oh, the broken phase. It right. Oh, sorry. The, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I amazingly, I still confuse these words, broken and unbroken. Right. Yes. No. I definitely don't mean that it's a constant. Indeed, we 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 studied the analog of this ansatz for that the the area law ansatz in this phase as well, um, and 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 there's some there's some. Uh, Sort of simple ODE that we can solve to, to match to the boundary condition. Yeah, so so there's some boundary condition for short loops, which uh, and there's uh, some flow to and it it's only for long loops that it behaves this way. Indeed, I, I think right, thank the, you. the solution is more complicated though. Yeah. So, uh, Oha, please ask the question. Hi, John. This is, this is very nice. Uh, do you know if there's a generalization of this that would be relevant for supersymmetric theories that have uh, one form symmetries, and is the effective action more constrained in that case? Oh, cool. Yeah, I, we haven't thought about that. I, yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I've been thinking a little, a little bit about, um, yeah, fermionic generalizations of higher form symmetries. But I, yeah, I should just say I don't know. Yeah, good question. So next, uh, Noda, Noda is. Could you ask a question? Yeah. So I have a bunch of questions. First of all, your action approximate or is it exact? In other words. In a standard lambda Ginsburg theory, we know it's an approximation, and we have some rule that controls the higher order corrections. Do you have such such rule here? What are you expanding here? Well, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm really following exactly the anal analogy with with the zero form case. So the the rule in the zero form case is there's some short distance that controls you know where this description breaks down, and the the, the dot dot dots here are, have inverse powers of that energy scale. Um, so the, I'm imagining exactly the same thing here. These dot, dot, dots are all other possible terms that you can write, again, suppressed by some, some short distance scale. Okay, so my question really splits in whether we are in the gapless case. I don't even know where the microphone is. So right. I don't know can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my question really splits whether we are in a gapless phase or a gapped phase. In a gapped phase, I don't see where you can expand in because there's nothing at long distances. And in the gapless phase, as you showed, it goes over to your photon. And then I know how to describe it. But then I think if you include both the photon and the loop, you overcount. So it's not clear to me, more generally, it's not clear to me what, what you're expanding in and when it is justified. Oh, Nadia, I, can, can, I'm confused about why you don't have the same confusion in the zero form case. So here too, there's a massless phase and a massive phase. And in the massive because, phase, because in the in the massless phase, the symmetry acts non-linearly on phi, and phi is the field in the low energy field theory. But then I do not need to add another order parameter, which is the exponential of phi, as a separate field. I have only one field, and I'm expanding as you wrote on this slide. The analogous thing in the one-form symmetry, when it's gapless, is that you write Maxwell theory. I, I think you do, not need to, you do not need to introduce also other operators. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm not introducing any other operators. I think the, the analogy is, is pretty precise. So in the, in the zero form case, um, there's um, here. So in the zero form case, I call it, there's this field phi, the, the linear variable, which transforms like this under the zero form case. And phi in the, in the broken phase is e to the i, let's say verify, the thing that transforms nonlinearly. And, the, and this is the gold star. Right, so similarly, I have this string field, which transforms like, like this. And in the broken phase, 
it's e to the i integral of a, and that's the gold star. So it's the, the, the counting of variables is the same, per, except, except that in my, in my lambda Ginsburg theory, I have a whole lot of other variables, which, which at low energies just get a mass. They get a mass of order the cutoff scale. Right, but when you write a Landau Ginsburg theory for in the first slide, when you have a U1 symmetry which is unbroken and use a complex field phi, then it's valid only near the transition point. It's not valid deep in the unbroken phase. Whereas if you are in the broken phase, you use var phi, and then again, you should just expand it. Uh, it seems to be like trying to get both. Good, you're, you're right. So, so, so indeed, the, the perspective is, uh, the, the theory, indeed, the, the ordinary lender user theory is useful, say, near the phase transition, uh, if you wanted to really use it as a theory to describe the excitations. But I think, I think the maybe a useful perspective is that it's, it nevertheless provides a representative of the phase, a representative state in, in the phase, um, which, uh, um, how to say, the universal property should agree. Uh, you're right that deep in the phase, maybe there can be some other microscopic degrees of freedom that come down if you want to, if you want some some theory that's valid up to some some large energy scale. I agree. But I think I think the analogy is is precise. So whatever you can do with the zero form case, you can do with this one form case. Okay, so uh, Miguel. So time is uh, running out, so please ask a short question. Yeah, it's a, it's a very quick question. Uh, I just wanted to know if you thought about uh, maybe generalizing this thing to, uh, uh, for instance, two form symmetries in five dimensions or something like that, uh, where you would have something like a membrane here, which is uh, more complicated. Indeed, yeah, good. So, so it's really, really inevitable that, that uh, you know, any, everything I said in this talk uh, can be generalized to, to P forms, except that, you know, instead of the action being a world line integral, the action becomes some some integral over of remembrance, which is something that yeah I, I don't maybe in the case of P equals two, we we from string we can use string theory technology to control it a bit, um, uh, but for the for the higher case I'm I'm a bit frightened I have to say, um, one reason that this is particularly interesting is that the the story I was trying to say about the costellus thallus like transition, um, in four dimensions. The analog, there's an analog of that in six dimensions for, for two forms. Um, I think, yeah, a very precise analog, um, which I think is yeah, very much worth exploring. Okay. Uh, so, Emir? Yeah, um, is, is, um, is the conventional string field theory that was reviewed in, uh, by um, Sweetback last week fit into your framework or no? I don't think so, no, because this, the string field that I'm talking about is gauge invariant. The ordinary string field theory has, you know, the, so the, is, are, the string field is a highly redundant variable. So all of the difficult, you know, a lot of the difficulties with like the A infinity algebras is, is, is to impose that gauge invariance, right? To get that gauge redundancy. And uh, whereas here, my string field is really a physical degree of freedom, ex except to the extent that many of the excitations it creates are, you know, at, at the scale of the cutoff. But to, to, the, to the extent that I can ignore that, the, that critical string field theory has ver vertices that are not local in loop space, right? They, they have sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of um, theta diagram that you were drawing in an yeah. early slide, that gets, ex it, that has various things attached to it that propagate things, or I think what Barton called stubs. Uh, so it's not really local in loop space. And I was wondering why you were insisting on writing something down that's local in loop space. No, I'm not. Indeed, this it, just as you said, this term is not local in loop space. It it, it involves an overlap of loops which are, at, you know, different points in loop space, macroscopically different. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, maybe I'll ask further questions in the in the Slack channel. Thanks. Uh, so yeah. So now it's time. Uh, it's just uh, enough. So let us thank the Joanne for great talk.